you guys may be seated. Now is the time of our service for the kids to come forward. Kids of all ages are invited to come up. So sit here in front of this circular thing, not on the side. Yeah, you guys sit in front. Don't go on the side. Boys, sit. I'm a lifeguard, so you always make me nervous. Can you go over here? Go over here? Go over here? Yes. Back up a little bit. Good job. I don't want you guys falling in. It is so good to be with you guys here today. Come on in and have a seat. We're excited that you're here because we're continuing our series on the power of the empty grave. And can you believe it? Spring is finally here. Can we get a little round of applause? Spring is here. I'm so excited for spring. I just couldn't wait, so I had to fill up my pool. Can we see it, please? Yes, this is my pool. I barely fit if I said crisscross applesauce. But I wanted to use this as an illustration because today we're talking about the power of Jesus to bring new life to some who would consider a lost cause. And so since spring is here, sandal weather is right around the corner. So I went on eBay to look for some new sandals. How many of you like eBay? Any eBay fans out there? eBay is great. You find all sorts of crazy stuff. And as I was looking for sandals, look at what I found. St. Peter's Fisherman Sandals with the power to walk on water. These are the actual sandals worn by St. Peter when he walked on water. These powerful relics can be only yours with just a click of buy now. And for only $31.91 plus free shipping, I just had to do it. So I purchased the sandals. I'm so excited. You guys want to see them? Oh, this is exciting. Oh, I haven't opened up yet. Wow. These are in great shape for being 2,000 years old, I'll tell you that one. Look at this. Wow, Peter had small feet, but these are amazing, right? Wow, and so I'm thinking of taking these out for a little spin. I'm gonna walk across Maple Lake later today, but I thought maybe one of you guys would wanna try walking on water. Anybody? Someone with small feet. So, <laughs> you, you wanna try it? Okay. Come have a seat. Oh, I'm so excited. She's gonna walk in water. Can you take off your boots and your socks? While she's getting ready, Lexi, would you mind putting these sandals on for her? Make sure you take off your socks too. Is that okay, Mom? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I should probably ask first. But as she's getting these powerful sandals that are gonna allow her to walk in water, I would like, if I could find this relic on eBay, what else did I have? So I went searching. We can also purchase St. Paul's chains when he was in jail. You can also find Samson's hair. You know, when they cut off Samson's hair, they, they sell that on eBay. But I also found Samson's hairbrush. Isn't that amazing? I'm sure that has, no, well, I don't need it, but some people do. And I even found Noah's umbrella. Isn't that a great relic? Okay, awesome, very good. Now I know they're a little bit big, but they are powerful. Remind me, what's your name, kiddo? Charlie, okay, I want you to get in there, Charlie. Okay, so stay right there. On the count of three, I want you to walk on water to me, okay? On the count of three, one, two, three, come towards me. Walk, what, it, are, you, are you doing something wrong? I, I, they don't, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I spent a lot of money on these. Can you try to walk on water again, Charlie? What, wait, okay, all right, so let's try it one more time. So this time, walk on water, are you ready? Go. Oh, this is embarrassing. Kids, it is not working at all. Let's give Charlie a round of applause. Charlie, I think there's something wrong with those sandals, all right? So kids, this is just terrible. I thought for sure, because again, when you see something in the internet, you have to believe what you see online, don't you? And so as we're gonna find out today, that I thought for sure, but hang on. <laughs> there's this woman who touches Jesus' outer garment and she's healed. And I thought, if that had magical powers, maybe Peter's shoes had magical powers. So clearly I'm confused about some things. So you guys can grab a piece of candy before you return to your seats. Do you know that one for a minute? Please don't fall, in the, please don't fall into the pool, guys. If you attend preschool through first grade, you could head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you could open up your Bibles to the book of Mark. And we're going to get to the bottom of why these sandals did not walk on water. <laughs> the internet lies. You're right. You're right. Did you grab them? Good job, guys. You know where you're going? If you're a guest with us today, normally I don't make such foolish purchases on eBay. But I thought for sure that I trusted that seller in Ohio. I think I'm going to put some 
some, some negative reviews on his, his page. But if you're a guest with us today, thank you again so much for being here in the middle of our Lent season, talking about the power of the empty grave. And so what we've learned that in the New Testament, something like 150 times, is this Greek word for dunamis, which is, means power and strength and ability. It's where we get the English word for dynamite. And so what we've seen, even though this is fake, again, if you're a guest with us today, please, it's fake, contained in a real stick of dynamite is amazing power to do some amazing things. And I have argued that if the church truly understood the power of the empty grave, we wouldn't be afraid to do things like share our faith with our friends and neighbors. And I don't think the church of North America would be in full retreat if we truly understood the power of the empty grave. And so today we're focusing specifically on the power, can we see it please, many? The power or the dunamis of Christ to give new life to people who some would consider a lost cause. And so when you hear that phrase, perhaps you've gone through a season in your life where you just feel like nothing's going right and everything's going wrong and, and, and you're, you're a lost cause. Or maybe you have a friend or family member that's really been struggling and and maybe they are acting like they're a lost cause. What we're going to see in today's passage is that the Lord brings new life to folks some would consider a lost cause. And so the setting of today's passage is, remember, Jesus is, is growing in his celebrity. There are people that have gone all around the known world to come and see this powerful working rabbi named Jesus. And so the crowds are so big, as he tries to walk, he kind of gets pushed around. Maybe you've been to a sporting event, right? Maybe the March Madness tournament, and after the game, you're trying to get out and you're just getting pushed and everybody's touching you. Or maybe after a concert's over, you're trying to get out and you're just getting pushed around. That's what is occurring in today's passage. His notoriety and his celebrity was so big that he struggled even to get down a city street without getting pushed. So I was trying to get a picture of what that would look like, and I found this short video of a celebrity trying to get from her car into a hotel in Paris. Can we see it? So imagine what it would have been like for Jesus, not just to go a few feet, but to go an entire length of a town trying to help someone who is in need of his power. So keep that in mind. It will be up on the screen, starting with verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. One of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, my, my little daughter, she's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. The woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, believing, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? You see the people crying against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and also fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. But Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, saying, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Look, don't be afraid. Just believe. 
He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said, what's with all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And so they laughed at him. After Jesus put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went to where that child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. She gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. And so this passage, we think, occurred in the same town of Capernaum that we've been visiting each and every week. And so, as you can imagine, he got a little bit of a break. You know, we think of John taking some folks out fishing. When you're out in the water, you kind of get away from it all. It's a good thing to do. And so Jesus, after a quick respite being out in the water, he gets back onto the shore, and they see that it's Jesus, and just like we saw in that paparazzi video, just the masses start pressing upon him. He puts his foot on dry land, and immediately there's this crowd. One person in the crowd sees it as Jesus, and it's this synagogue ruler named Jairus. And so we believe if he worked at the same synagogue, or if you remember, Jesus pushed back the forces of darkness, he has seen with his own eyes a miraculous, powerful work of Jesus. He's heard all of the different healings. And when he sees that Jesus is there, he comes running through the crowd and falls at the feet of Jesus, begging, pleading with Jesus, saying, my daughter, She's dying, and we see in the text that she is about to die. She is on death's door. She's breathing her last breaths, and so there's an urgency in his voice. And he says to Jesus, please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Immediately, Jesus went to the person's home. He has this urgency. When someone asks for help and cries out for help, Jesus is going to drop whatever he's doing. He's going to go and do what he was called to do. But he couldn't because there's all these people pressing on him. And, and Mark describes that this large crowd was growing and, and pressing him and, and pushing him all around and he couldn't get to Jairus' house. But in that crowd was someone else, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now we don't know exactly, but most biblical scholars think she had some sort of physical disorder with her menstrual cycle. So again, 12 years of non-stop misery and suffering would be terrible. But in the first century, it was even worse. Because in the first century Palestine, if you're a woman, you would not be able to go near your friends and family because you were viewed as unclean. And so you were put out of town during that time. For 12 years, she couldn't have any associations with friends and family. Also, because of her condition, she couldn't get married. So imagine the loneliness. Imagine how she was feeling just left out. She couldn't even come to worship for 12 years. That was what the ceremonial law. She couldn't even touch another person because there was a superstition that whatever disease she had would be passed on and someone else would also be unclean. So imagine in her, her misery, She'd suffered a great deal, and she went to these ancient doctors, spent all the money she had, and instead of getting better, she actually got worse. So she would be the perfect definition in the ancient world of a lost cause. There's nothing left to do for her. But then she heard about Jesus. She heard the stories of this powerful rabbi. She came up behind him and touched his outer cloak. So let me see someone with an outer... Grant, can you come here? I know. He's like, what did I do? He didn't do anything. Okay. So the outer garment. So in the ancient world, they'd have an inner garment and they'd have an outer garment. So you're going to be Jesus for a minute, okay? Okay. So you're kind of walking around and everybody's kind of pushing. And what this woman did is she came up behind face that way, and she touched his outer garment. Now you say, well, why did she do that, Grant? Good job. She touched that because she had a super, superstitious belief that... The clothes of powerful people somehow were magical. But let's be honest. If you had a jersey of your favorite athlete, let's just say it was Tom Brady's jersey. And, and Tom, yes, Tom Brady, picking on your mom a little bit. Tom Brady, let's just say he that 
and it still smelled like sweaty football player. And you had a Tom Brady jersey up in your house. You kind of believe that, oh, that's sort of special, right? It's sort of magical. If something was owned by a famous person, you kind of believe that there was some power to it. They believed that in the ancient world as well. And even though she was superstitious, she reached out. She said, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And surprisingly, verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt her body was freed from her suffering. Just like that. So how's Jesus supposed to respond? We see in the text that word dunamis. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. Now what would that have been like? Now again, many of you know I'm allergic to blood. I have a physical condition. It's psychological, I know. But when I give blood, I always pass out. And so when we do blood drives here at the church and I have to get into my office, I kind of go like this. Because if I just see the blood, a boom, then be on the ground, they have to do the spelling salt. It's very embarrassing. But if you've ever given blood, you know the experience of it's like your life force is draining out of you, right? Is that something's not right? And so somehow, as Jesus was walking, when that woman touched his cloak, in faith, the power left him and was able to heal her. Jesus sensing that the power has left him, he asks, well, who's, who's touching me? And so his disciples are kind of like secret service details. They're kind of trying to get Jesus through the crowd. And they're like, Jesus, everybody's touching you. What do you mean who touched you? We don't know. And they're getting frustrated. But he looks around and he wants to know who did it. Finally, this woman, knowing what had happened, keep in mind, because of her physical condition, it was against the law for her to touch anyone. And yet she knew that she was healed. And she was trembling with fear because she thought she was going to get in trouble and punished. But she told him the whole truth. And how are we supposed to understand that? And so bear with me. I want to read something to you. See, see if this makes some sense. We'll be up on the screen as well. Manny, can we see it? Jesus' point here was that the needs of God's people are a higher priority for him than these ceremonial observances. Therefore, he did not make an issue of the woman's technical violation of the law. He was very gentle in dealing with the woman who had suffered so long. But what did Jesus say to her? He did not say, daughter, your touch has made you well. Neither did he say, daughter, my garments have made you well. No, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. What did he mean? There was no intrinsic power in her faith. Her faith was not the efficient cause of her healing. It was Jesus. Jesus was. But her faith was the instrumental cause of her healing, just as in our justification. God does not declare us righteous because there's any inherent righteousness in our faith, promoting God to say, because of your faith, I will save you. No. Faith is the instrumental cause of justification because it is the tool or the instrument by which we take hold of Christ. And so finally to the woman, Jesus says, go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And it's important that the verb tense there that Jesus used told the woman, you are healed permanently. And so you can imagine the scene. You can imagine the people gathered and they've seen this woman be miraculous. And it would be a great story to end right there. But many of you are saying, well, wait a minute. What about Jairus' daughter? There was an urgency, and now Jesus had been distracted, and he stopped to talk to this woman. And we see that while he was still speaking to this woman, some men from the house of Jairus came, saying, your daughter is dead. Why bother the rabbi? It's too late. She's a lost cause. But how does Jesus respond? Ignoring what they said, Jesus looks right at the girl's father, and says, don't be afraid, just believe. Because again, the man had great faith when he fell at the feet of Jesus, saying, if you would just come and lay hands on my daughter, she would be healed. Now Jesus is asking this man to extend his faith that Jesus even has the power to bring a person back from the dead. If this occurred in 1981 and, and, and there was a journey there, everybody would start singing, don't stop believing. I was just making sure you're all awake. Sure all awake. <laughs> and so they go. 
He did not let anyone except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, come. And when they get to the home of the synagogue ruler, they saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And I learned this week in my study that in the first century, if you were a person of importance, you were actually obligated to hire professional wailers, professional mourners, professional criers. And since Jairus was a pretty important person in Capernaum, he had a whole team of professional mourners. Their job was to cry and to wail and to tear their clothes as a sign of mourning. So Jesus walks up on these people who, again, it would be like for us if a family member was about to die, we'd hire a mortician at a funeral home. So he walks up on this commotion and he says, why all of this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Now notice they make fun of him because their job is to be around people who died. They know full well that this girl is in fact dead. And that's why they make fun of Jesus when he said she's not dead. She's just asleep. Now why would he say that? Now remember, Jesus is revealing who he is. The same God that has the power to create the world, of course he has the same power to bring a person back from the dead. And so us as parents, as grandparents, now again, I don't know if you have children like this that maybe struggle to get up in the morning to go to school. Do you guys have any kids like that? Right? As parents, we have the power to wake our children up and say, hey, it's time for school. Everybody's going like this. Some people are pointing at each other, right? Parents, we have the power to wake a person to get ready for school. Jesus had the power to bring a person back from the dead. So he gets to the home, takes out all of those professional mourners, and only the few disciples, the mother and father, goes into the room, takes her by the hand, and in Aramaic says, Talitha kum. Now, that is not some magical words, right? But in Aramaic, it means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Now, keep in mind that Jesus is God. And when Jesus created the universe, what did he do? He spoke. He said, let there be light. And there was light, right? Let there be land and poof. And so by the sound of his voice, amazing things happen. And when this little girl, even though she was dead a moment before, when she heard the voice of the creator God and Lord Jesus say, little girl, get up. Immediately, that was all it took. That's what she needed. She stood up and walked around. We see that she was 12 years old. What a miracle. With just the sound of Jesus' voice, he has the power to give new life to this girl. At this, they were completely astonished, as you can imagine. But he gave them some orders. Don't tell anyone about this. Why? Because remember how big the crowd was? Could you imagine if people found out that he's bringing dead people back to life? He wouldn't be able to walk anywhere and finish his earthly ministry. And the second command was, give the poor girl something to eat. Why? To not only prove that she was alive, because if you're alive, you need to eat, but also to prove that she was just the same girl that they had seen. And to demonstrate the power that Jesus had to bring new life to some who would consider a lost cause. And so think back to my children's illustration. I'm going to be honest, folks. I think that person lied to me. I think I was taken advantage of. This is why mom and dad always told me, buyer beware. Because let's be honest, these sandals, Charlie, are you still over there? These sandals did not have the power to walk on water. Charlie, thanks for doing that. I would have really felt really awkward over in Maple Lake today if she hadn't tried it out for me. And I'm going to be honest, folks, I don't even think St. Peter owned these sandals. So I'm definitely going to put some negative reviews on eBay. But if we were to go on eBay and if we were to find the outer garment of Jesus that has the power to heal, keep in mind, don't buy it. It's a lie. Because just like the sandals didn't have any power, it wasn't the garment that had the power to heal that woman. It was Jesus. And so I want you to think, thank you, I want you to think of someone in your life, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, that is really struggling. Maybe today they're feeling like a lost cause. What we've learned in today's passage, no matter what is going on in our lives or the lives around us, there's nothing, there's no such thing that for God's people to be a lost cause. And so as I was finishing up this week, my study, the Lord led me to Psalm 88. Can we look at that, please, Manny? We're going to finish here. Imagine what it would be like to feel this way. See if this resonates with anyone here. 
The psalmist cries out, God, you're my last chance of the day. I spend the night on my knees before you. Put me on your salvation agenda. Take notes on the trouble I'm in. I've had my fill of trouble. I'm camped out on the edge of hell. I've written it off as a lost cause. One more statistic, a hopeless case. Abandoned is already dead. One more body and a stack of corpses and not so much as a gravestone. But soon the psalmist begins to sing, I call to you, God. All day I call. I wring my hands. I plead for help. Are the dead alive audience for your miracles? Do ghosts ever join the choirs that praise you? Does your love make any difference in a graveyard? Is your faithful presence noticed in the corridors of hell? Are your marvelous wonders ever seen in the dark? Your righteous ways noticed in the land of no memory. I'm standing my ground, God. I'm shouting for help at my prayers every morning on my knees each daybreak. I imagine that's how that woman felt. I imagine that's how that father felt when he was told your daughter died. But just when you think all hope is lost, in the very next psalm, the very same person is given the strength and the ability to sing something else. He sings, your love, God, is my song. And I'll sing it. I'm forever telling everyone how faithful you are. I'll never quit telling the story of your love. So maybe you're asking, how was the psalmist able to make such a dramatic, emotional, and, and spiritual turn? Because in faith, what he needed to learn was that for God, none of his people are ever a lost cause. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we've worked through this passage, I know for me, I've thought of people in my life, even times and seasons, my own journey with you, where I felt like a lost cause. Lord, I thank you for this woman described in today's passage, that when she heard the stories of Jesus in faith, she reached out to you for healing. And this father, even though it seemed that all hope was lost and that his daughter had died, Lord, we know that she did. And yet, all hope was still not lost because death never has the final word for you, Lord Jesus. And yet you said to him and you said to all of us, do not fear, just believe. So Lord, help us to have that belief. Help us to have that faith because we know most of all that is what we need. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.